All right, so we're going to move on here. Uh, again, reminder, can we got your current event for tomorrow? Some way, somehow, we are home because of snow. Just record it and turn that in. You can just email it to me. All right, so we just went over the test. We went over the exam. Everybody did pretty well. Um, is there any questions on that at all? I know I just videoed it and recorded it and put it out for you guys yesterday. But, uh, if there's any questions, just let me know at the end of class here. There's maybe something I messed up on. Check it out. All right. <clears throat> so starting Chapter 2 today. Research methods. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, what do you think might happen here? Maybe a research project or paper. No? You don't think? No, I don't think we should. Why don't you think we should? Just a shrug of the shoulder. That that's the only explanation for it, I guess, huh? All right, so real quick. I like you to write down anxiety. Your definition of anxiety. You don't have to look it up or anything, but describe it. All right, what is anxiety? Describe that and give examples of it. So I know for me, I, I know whenever I feel anxious or I, I feel some anxiety, I always get like real warm. Does anybody get that feeling? Get real warm. My face starts to like almost boil up. I'm like, oh, my face starts to get red. I know I get the, the butterflies in my stomach, especially when I'm about to do something like a sport or an activity. I don't know. All right, so write down your definition of anxiety and give examples. Maybe how you feel when you're anxious or you know that something's coming. Maybe it's a long-term project. Maybe it's a test. Oh, boy. So again, you don't have to look it up. Just right off the top of your head, your definition of anxiety. And give examples of it. Just give me a minute to do that. Okay, anxiety, what do you got, Sarah? What's your definition? I said, like, a feeling of nervousness or fear comes from like, anxiety or anxiety. Okay, all right. So what examples do you have of anxiety? I would say, like, when you start a sports event or something, like, getting anxiety before that or feeling anxious before doing something important to you and you don't want to mess up. Yeah. Does it always have to be bad? No. No. Why not? Well, because you can be anxious over like some a good or positive event. Okay. Because, you know, because you're nervous about feeling bad. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like maybe it's something just competing alone. It's like that's good. And that's something that it's not a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, you just don't know. It's unpredictable, I guess. Right? You don't know what actions could happen or what what event might occur. And it's certain to how you would react to it, right? 
good, good. So I'm guessing with you, with running especially, how was the, what was it, 23K you ran? It was supposed to be a 25. 25, okay. How was that? Well, it wasn't great. Uh-oh. Why? What happened? I was running in the snow, and my ankles got basically pulled off, so that was... Oh, my gosh. Jeez. What, do you have to run in boots? I didn't run in long socks, because I didn't know what was going to do in the snow. Jeez. Yeah, you... Do you know where the water treatment plant in Vikings is? I don't know. No, it's just like a mile on the road, and then eight miles in the snow. Oh, <laughs> It was supposed to, it got short. It wasn't good enough because the, it was unplowed and everything. So yeah. running in the snow is way different. There's a foot of snow. Running through that's just not. Maybe you guys should postpone the event. I don't know. <laughs> My coach put it on as part of his running club. Really? You were the one, right? You were one of the three? Yeah, I, I okay. finished it, but most of the people were like, can you just turn around? Wow. I tried to turn around. So. <laughs> I bet, I bet. I'm sure your coach finished it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say he's he's a runner there, man. Well, it was Welker with you, Brock. No. No. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure you felt anxious about that. I'm sure you had some sort of anxiety or stress, maybe with that, uh, especially running through the snow. That'd be terrible. Yeah. It be terrible. Was. Oh, I think it's hard just walking through the snow, running, especially up a mountain. I'm sure, right? Oh, geez, geez. Good for you, Sarah. I don't know if I could have done that. I probably would have just stepped up. Yep, nope, not doing it. Not doing it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so anxiety. I mean, I'm sure you had some sort of stress there with that. I mean, that, that sounds like a... I don't know. I wouldn't do it. All right, Mikhail, what do you have? All right, good, good. What examples do you have? Okay, all right. So maybe it's like public speaking or something. Maybe it's uh, delivering a presentation in front of a group of people. Yeah, and you're kind of you're kind of quiet. So I'm sure that's is that something you get anxious over. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, or maybe it's the Bills game, right? The Buffalo Bills with TC. I'm just kidding. Yeah, especially public speaking. I, I was always really shy. I could never, when I was in high school and college, I'd just go up and kind of freeze. Like, Ooh, I don't know about this. But after a while, teaching, I mean, that's what you do every single day. So you get kind of used to it. Kind of just cross that wall, cross that, cross that, uh, that problem. Yeah, good job. So public speaking especially, I, I you know that's difficult. All right, Campbell, what do you have? I see much Yeah, yeah, especially like it's almost like the fear of the unknown, right? You, you don't know what's going to happen, and right away, what is the worst possible thing that could happen here? Okay, and that's probably – I want to make sure I'm prepared somewhat by thinking about it. All right, what examples do you have? Um, I said like planning an event, maybe a wedding or something, it would be distracted. Okay. About the worst. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, wedding plan. Oh, my gosh. My brother's wife, she was a wreck. Getting ready for her wedding, I, I, I see why. I guess it's like that. That's the perfect day. That's the day, you know. Especially for that relationship. Oh man, I ruined the. I ruined. <laughs> I ruined the speech. I guess you have to. Uh, he won't see my brother. Or anything. Do you guys know? Uh, oh, I graduated last year. I forgot his name now. Can't think of it. But he was there. Aiden Teeter was there, and I gave my best man speech for my brother. Oh, boy. I had too many uh, sodas, and uh, it didn't come out too well. But, <laughs> but, yeah, I was definitely anxious and nervous about that. Uh, and, yeah, wedding plan. I, I, I couldn't imagine that. You're not looking to get married soon, are you? No. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good. All right, for me, especially with sports, uh, first time I wrestled at States, that was one of the big things, and the giant sender. It's like, oh, I worked my whole life for it, you know, and then just don't want to fail, don't want to lose. 
And I guess that's the first thing that comes to mind. What are the per first possible problems there? What, what, what could happen here that could just totally go wrong? It's like I could underperform. I could go out and get pinned real quick. I could get hurt, right? Uh, there's a lot of different things that could happen that could cause a lot of stress or anxiety. I know with tests especially or research papers that could bring on a lot, a lot of anxiety, especially when you see that due date approaching closer and closer and closer. That's one thing in this class for this chapter here. I like to do a research project, um, you know, a paper presentation on something that you would that you find uh, that you find interesting in, and that you would maybe like to do a study on. And uh, I'm thinking, what do you think? Yeah, let's say I only come back on Tuesday. I'll put out the guidelines and the outline today after class. And, you guys can come up with a project, a presentation, or something you want to maybe study. Come up with a rep representative sample, a population. Come up with variables, independent, dependent variables, confounding variables, experimental controls, control group, experimental group. Kind of detail and describe that. Does that work for Tuesday? You think we can do that? All right, cool. All right, like I said, I'll post that up for at the end of class here. I'm just kidding. It's not going to be Tuesday. Don't worry about it. That build anxiety up for you or not? I thought I did pretty well not uh, not giving a smirk or a laugh. No, Mikhail, you're, you're feeling anxious, weren't you? Yeah, ooh, yeah. Hoo, 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 hoo. Sarah's like, ah, bring it on, right? Yeah, we've had a <laughs> really? We have a test tomorrow. When did you know about it? <sighs> oh, geez. Like it's just like integrated into a classroom post, not mentioned in class. It's like, by the way, that's for kids. Okay. <laughs> Been there, done that. I can. <laughs> yeah. So especially with practice, that helps definitely alleviate alleviate some anxiety or stress. You guys were used to that for great fear. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. But anyway, I'd like to probably towards the end of the, the chapter, maybe have something along the lines of a project presentation. You write maybe like a short paper, paper like three pages long describing your study. And But it's not going to be due Tuesday. Don't worry about that. This is a longer chapter. We're going to talk about research methods, and there's going to be a lot of things that I want to discuss, especially a lot of things I detail, the variables and everything. And it's kind of what I wanted to throw. And so I was like, oh, what is this? What is an independent? What's a dependent variable? How do you describe it? What's a confounding variable? And uh, kind of building on the anxiety. It's the fear of the unknown, I guess, right? All right, so I like doing that before the start of this one a lot. Um, why do we need research? Why, why do you think it's needed? Why do you think it's necessary to have research? Why do you think it's necessary to perform research and go through some of these studies and predict behaviors and describe and have an explanation and an influence. Four goals of psych, right? Why do you think, Sarah? I would say to understand ourselves better so that we understand our issues. Like it's like being knowledgeable on the topics and being what we have. Yeah, good job, good job. It's almost like practice, right? I kind of detailed that already. If we go through this process, if we almost have a – uh, guidelines or set standards of how we accomplish something, that task or that objective is going to be a little bit easier, right? I know with training through running, it's just the first time you go out, it's not going to be pretty. Uh, the more you run, the more you compete at something. Uh, maybe there's forms of technique that you can accomplish or breathing techniques or nutrition, especially. I'm sure that plays a huge role. If there's, if there's definitely guidelines and practice to some things, we can accomplish these objectives. We can go through some of these, these, uh, these uh, objectives a little bit easier. And that's kind of what research is all established for. We can relate it to anything, running. We can relate it to wedding planning, I guess, right? We can relate it to giving presentations in class. But we all can agree that practice makes perfect. And if we know certain guidelines and, and uh and standards that are set and established and we experience it over and over again, then those, those things aren't so bad, those, those tasks. All right, so real quick, I usually go through a demonstration with three 
students in here, it's hard to do. So I just kind of present, um, it's just an idea of relationships. So here's a scenario here. It says, psychologists have found that separation weakness uh, weakens romantic attraction. As the saying goes, out of sight, out of mind. So with relationships, long distance relationships, we all know that's tough, right? We all know that's really difficult to do. And uh, to if you don't see your partner every day, if you don't communicate with them, it's almost like uh, this gap, this, this distance between you, it creates a gap between your relationship and your relationship. And then the other form, so group A would see that, right? And then group B would see this statement. Psychologists have found that separation strengthens romantic attraction. As the saying goes, um, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Again, there's different interpretations to certain scenarios, certain experiences, especially with relationships. And then at the end, I'd have you communicate. Obviously, Group A and Group B would talk to each other. And then they would just say, what is, impact does separation have in romantic relationships? So Campbell would say, oh, it strengthens the further distances. And Sarah, you'd say, oh, uh, you know, the further distance, you know, out of sight, out of mind. I just kind of move on to where I'm located and kind of experience the world just where I'm located kind of give up on those relationships. I like to do that one, obviously, with three students. It's hard to do. And this just goes to show, right, we need to make sure that we have um, we have all the information. And then if there's two answers to a certain uh, form of research or an experiment that we're going through, then maybe we got to look back. Maybe we got to figure out exactly how we can try to solve these, these problems to having one answer to it. Okay, again, through all the approaches and perspectives we went through, there's multiple answers to some scenarios and case studies where we can explain uh, a certain case study through different lenses, through different perspectives, and through different approaches through psychology. I think we all can agree to that, right? All right, so real quick, moving on here. So with research, you might fall into some of these scenarios, some of these cases here. And one of the one in particular is hindsight bias. What is hindsight bias? I'm going to go back so you just can't read it. What is hindsight bias? What do you think that is? Campbell, do you ever hear about that before? Well, is it like hindsight when like, you didn't know about something? That, like, that result could have changed? Exactly. Yep, exactly. So looking at things in hindsight, is that event already occurred? It already happened, right? And after that event happened, you know the results. You know whatever happened, happened. You then say, well, I could have told you that, but what happened? Just look at all of the, I guess you could say, all of the steps that made that conclusion occur, okay? But did you really actually know that that was going to happen? Did you actually know that event was going to occur? No, you didn't, right? You didn't. So it's almost to a point where you're basing it off of emotion, off of, um, you're basing it off of thoughts that you have after the fact, after something already concluded. We can say that especially with gambling, right? Yeah. Did anybody know who was going to win the Super Bowl? Michaela, did you know who was going to win? Oh, okay. All right. So you guessed right. I guessed right, too. I picked the Buccaneers. I won, I won me some money. So gambling especially. So with event happening here with the Super Bowl, we know that Patrick Mahomes is one of the best quarterbacks ever. He's such a talent. He's young. And that team was really, really good that the Chiefs had. The Buccaneers, right? That team was incredible. Tom Brady once, obviously won the Super Bowl, has seven Super Bowls now. It's hard to bet against that guy. But let's say I would have picked the Chiefs going into it. It's like, okay, the Chiefs really lit up the scoreboard. They only had, I think, two losses all season compared to the Buccaneers five or six. It's like on paper, it just seems like the Chiefs are going to win. So if I would have picked, or let's say I wanted to bet at all, right? Let's say I wanted to bet at all. I wanted to pick the decision here. I would have went through it. The Buccaneers won. Looking back on it, I could have threw money down on the Bucs. I could have won. I knew that they're going to win. Tom Brady's going to his 10th Super Bowl appearance. He won his seventh, right? Come on. That's easy money. That's easy thoughts. But at the same time, no one knows, right? No one knows. And that's with research especially. Once you're going through research, once you're going through an experiment, we got to try to exclude and hide that hindsight bias because that could really cause a disruption with our study. Right. If we just kind of go through the experiment and already kind of know our conclusion, what we actually want, 
this could hinder our study and make it really not replicable uh, and not uh, not um, approvable, I guess you could say either. And people might not actually trust your results, especially if you're going through the going through the motions and actually not going through that scientific method. Does that make sense with hindsight bias? Okay. All right, I threw some examples here with the Titanic, right? Well, you're sailing at night, in the early 1900s. You're going across the Atlantic Ocean during, you know, you know during these t cold periods of times. You're going to run into an iceberg. That's going to happen. Did everybody? Did anybody know that was going to happen? Probably not. No one did. Why else would you buy the ticket to go on on the plane or in the on the uh, boat here? No one would die. All right. There's many things that we could look back on and maybe change and conclude that, oh, yeah, that was easy. That was something that was predictable when realistically no one knew. All right, so real quick, uh, priming. What do you think priming is? What is priming? I don't really have a slide for this. What is priming? What do you think that is? In many cases, people call it in, in economics pump priming. What is it, Sarah? Okay. All right. So in this case, let's say for a study, let's say you were going to try to perform a study. How do you try to prime someone to, I don't, I don't want to give it away. So you might be priming someone to get the answer that you're looking for, right? If you're performing a study. Um, I don't know. Let's just say for tastings of food, pizza, right? Uh, you might prime someone in order to get that results by really just kind of probing for that information, probing that person to direct them towards the answer that you're looking for and that you would really want. Okay. So this happens a lot in studies. Okay. I, I kind of lost what I was getting out with the pizza. I just kind of gave up on it. But uh, with priming, uh, this is something that researchers do, psychologists, scientists do to try to get the results that they're looking for. And they're just going to guide people to make a choice or make a decision that they want. Um, it happens a lot with like I mentioned with food, that's kind of what I was getting towards. Uh, with food, uh, you walk into Subway, especially the one here in Eville, what do you see on the walls? What do they have like pictures of on the walls? Maybe you haven't been in Subway for a long time. I don't know. But what do you see on the walls in Subway? Tasty food, healthy ingredients, right? This is uh, ingredients that you know is going to be um, fresh, right? That's their slogan, eat fresh. Okay, you see the tomatoes, the lettuce. It looks all appealing. It looks all um, fresh food. It doesn't look like there's preservatives in there. It doesn't look like it's any type of fast food chain restaurant type of food, right? We know that this is fresh food and it's going to be um, something that's healthy. Um, same thing with restaurants. A lot of times they play music. They're not going to play screamo, uh, heavy metal music, are they? No, they're going to play something calm and soothing to make, sh make you feel comfortable in that setting. And there's some psychologists that actually test with wine tastings. Okay, sometimes they play like a German, a German uh, melody or a, uh, a French melody to try to persuade people. They don't think it's actually happening, but in their unconscious mind, it's driving them to purchase or buy a flavor of wine that kind of goes with the sound. It, it's weird how it works, but they try to prime people in trying to pairing these things together. Um, wine tastings, especially when you're 21, I'm sure you'll go and do it. Uh, they pump, they prime people to say, Hey, this, um, this source of food, like a whoopie pie goes together real well with a sweet wine. Okay. It primes people. It's like, actually pushing people to buy certain products when realistically, do you need it? No. But at the time that's the business's goal is to try to prime people to purchase more of an item that maybe necessarily they don't want or need. Okay. Sales, you name it, right? You see 10% off, 20% off of a certain item. It's going to prime you to actually make that purchase. There's many examples of it. You guys understand that? We're good. Okay, cool. And then finally, halo effect. What is halo effect? Maybe that's something you never really heard of. What is halo effect? What is the halo effect? Kayla, do you know? What do you think it is? Without looking it up. You don't know? Campbell? You don't know. Sarah? Well, 
Oh, well, do you look it up already? Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay, good. Good job. Good job. Especially when you're conducting research, the halo effect could really skew your results. So, not to pick on your relationship here, Mikhail, but if you're performing a study and you have TC involved, right? You have TC involved. You're going to try to make sure it's favorable that he gives an outcome or gives a description or gives a an answer that makes him seem smart, makes him seem appealing to other people, right? It doesn't make him seem dumb if he got the answer wrong or if he falls in the effect of whatever you're trying to research or find. So the halo effect is almost like you're treating other people depending on your relationship with them, how you might appeal to that person. Uh, maybe you have an attraction for that person, right? Uh, you might um, act differently around them. I don't know who everybody else is dating, but Mikhail, I know you're dating TC, so I'm just going to say. So, like, let's say you're in a car, okay, and TC spills his drink in your car. Maybe you're at, you're at the stage of your relationship where you're going to yell and scream at him and hit him. I don't know. But let's say at the beginning of the relationship, you're in the honeymoon phase, right? Uh, he spills his drink in your car. Are you going to yell at him? Are you going to scream at him? Are you going to tell him to clean it up and get out, and he's going to walk the rest of the way? What? Oh my gosh, you're terrible. No, so with that honeymoon phase, you probably wouldn't do that. It's like, oh, don't worry, honey. I'll get it. That's okay. Things happen. It is what it is. And then let's say you're five years into the relationship or something like that. He spills it. Get, get out. Grab it. Toss it out. You're walking the rest of the way. I don't trust you in my car ever again. You're shampooing it. You're doing whatever. Okay. Or let's say it's your brother or your sister or whatever. You know, you're only a child. You're only a child. Or you know what I'm getting at, though? Okay, depending on your relationship, depending on who you're studying especially, this could skew the results depending on your relationship with them. Okay, so we need, we need to make sure that we kind of push that out of the way, right? And uh, how those ties might make or break our study depending on who we're actually analyzing, what kind of answers we're actually looking for. I think it's important to talk about that before we actually get into some of the examples and, you know, when we talk about variables and things like that. That makes sense, guys. We good? So got we went over hindsight bias, how that can skew and really uh, push our results in the wrong direction. Priming, okay. We're trying to seek people to find that uh, that certain answer that we're looking for as researchers. Many people do this. It's kind of cool. All right, so we put up. It's almost like hanging. So we got to guess the word here. We got to guess the word. So if I'm going to talk about Campbell's Chunky, what are you going to say? Soup. Yeah, okay. Soup. All right. What if I'm going to talk about Axe, Body, Spray? What are you going to think there? Soap. All right. Yeah, so it's again, I'm priming you towards that answer, priming you towards that, okay, for what, for what you to say, depending on the characteristics, depending on the background noise, depending on. Uh, some of the hints I'm giving you. So that's a fun way of priming. Some people actually just kind of give papers out and do that, but I won't do that. But restaurants especially, they prime you all the time. Businesses, they make sure that you buy every product and try to push your unconscious mind and purchase these, these uh, different types of products and these different types of things. All right, is there any questions? And then halo effect, obviously, I mentioned that last. Okay, how our results could skew because of a relationship. Okay, how it might be confounding uh, depending on who we're, who, we're, who we're studying and what kind of results we're looking for. All right, that's all I got for today. That's all I got. So you got what, like five minutes here? Not bad. Not bad. I was going to assign that reading for you today, but I won't. Campbell said not to do it. 